let's see. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is one. After the book came out, and again, book clubs are sometimes puzzled by when they have me visit. Sometimes they're a little puzzled by what I say to them. And you know, one of the things that was really hard for me, I just wrote the book as 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 hard as I could, you know, and. And I got a, uh, my brother Kevin, after he read the book, saying, he sent me a page of periods. You can use these. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that funny? <laughs> Who's laughing? I see you. Take the names of all the people who are laughing. <laughs> I got a letter the other day, I got a letter recently from a guy who said, Dear Mr. Doyle, I've read your work for 20 years and here are your problems. <laughs> You're addicted to alliteration, run-on sentences, semicolons, and passionate overwriting. <laughs> so, and I, write, I try to write back to everybody. I thought, well, all those are accurate, actually. But I try to write back to everybody who writes to you. I think that, that's another one of your moral responsibilities. You should answer letters that you get from readers, even the lunatic fringe ones. And, you know, and so, but sometimes you're out of your league, so I called my dad and said, Pop, I just got this letter, I don't know how to respond. He goes, get a pen, I'll dictate. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, all right, I'm ready. He goes, dear sir, you may be right. And don't you think passionate overriding is the very best kind of overriding? <laughs> 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 made me laugh. We actually have, I have several form letters. I read the University of Portland's magazine, which is really unusual, a good magazine, very odd. And, and I have, we have several form letters. Um, because we get a lot of lunatic fringe letters, generally from generally from Lutherans for some reason. Anybody here? <laughs> <laughs> the poor things, you know. As my, my father said to me recently, you know, of course Martin Luther was right. You know, he the, the, the guy was totally right. A, people forget he was a Catholic monk. Okay, Martin Luther was Catholic. How funny is that, Brian? Yes, yes, dead. And he goes, but you know, the 95 theses on the door. Could he not have used scotch tape? <laughs> you know, he ruined a perfectly good church door. Other than that, the Lutherans were right. Anyway, but after the book came out, I just, I just wrote it. I wanted to listen to the characters and, and catch their flow and, and, and witness their life, their, their reverence, their, their thorny grace, their defiant courage. You know, they were people to me. They were people to me. I could hear them. I couldn't see them. And one of the things I hope you notice in the book is that there's very little physical description. I, I just say tall or short, right? I never say handsome or pretty. Those words don't exist in the book. I, apparently, the women all have long flowing hair, which was a mystery to me. And people, people have pointed this out to me. I'm like, really? And then I look around my house and I realize all the women have long flowing hair. So. But, I, but I wanted to listen to them, and I wanted you to imagine what they looked like. And, and to me, they were real, you know, and if I, I got to the point with the book where I, I, every morning I'd sit down and open it up and, and I'd read the last chapter or two just to hear the music again, to get the cadence, and, and, then, and then say, all right, who's up? And without fail, one of the characters would be, my turn, my turn, where have you been? It's 8 o'clock, let's go. <laughs> you know, and, but then after the book was finished, uh, you're supposed to get up and read and, and, do, and be intelligent about it. And, and I found it curiously hard to pick a piece to read because I'd spent so much time stitching all the pieces together that to yank one out would mean one of those awful literary readings where the explanation for the reading goes on longer than the reading does. You know? So, But the one piece that worked, I discovered in the beginning, was this one. There's a scene at the end uh, where the man who's got three days left to live, remember the guy who's a timekeeper? Right? He's got, I think, three days left to live, and I think it's Declan who says to him, can I ask you a question, man? Can I ask you a blunt question? What, happened, what mattered to you in your life? What mattered to you, really? And the guy says, hawks huddled disgruntled against hissing snow, wrens in winter thickets, swallows carving and slicing and swimming fat grinning summer air, blueberries, gooseberries, salmon berries, my children learning to read, the sinuous liquid flow of rivers and minks and cats, fresh bread with way too much butter, my children's hands when they cut my ancient grizzled face in their hands, exuberance and ebullience, tears of sorrow which are the salt seas of the heart, Sleep in every form from doze to bone weary. The shivering ache of a saxophone and the yearning of an oboe. Folding laundry hot from the dryer. Cobblers and tailors, spotless kitchen floors, the way horses smell in spring. Postcards in which the sender has written so much that he or she can barely squeeze in a signature. <laughs> Opera on the radio, toothbrushes, the postman's grin, the green sifting powdery snow of cedar pollen on the porch every year. The way herons labor through the sky with such vast elderly dignity. People who care about hubcaps, the cheerful ears of dogs, all photographs of every sort, tip jars, wine glasses, the way barbers sweep up circles of hair after haircuts so politely, so courteously, handkerchiefs, libraries, 
poems read aloud by older poets, fedora hats, excellent knives, the very idea of albatrosses and thesauruses, <laughs> the tiny screws that hold spectacles together, book marginalia done with the lightest possible pencil as if the reader is whispering to the writer. <laughs> People who keep dead languages alive, wooden rulers, fresh mown lawns, first baseman's mitts, dish racks, the way my sons smell after their baths, the moons of Jupiter, the fact that our species produced Edmund Burke, naps of every size, junior policeman badges, walruses, cassocks, surpluses, the orphan caps of long lost pens, welcome mats, ice cream trucks, all manner of bees, cabbages and kings, eulogy and elegy and puppetry, fingernail clippers. The rigging of sailing ships, ironing boards, hoes and sights, the mysterious clips that girls wear in their hair so that when you kiss them from behind, their clip explodes in your face. <laughs> Bass and bluefish, furriers and farriers, trout and grout, peach pies of every size. The sprawling porches of old hotels and the old men who sprawl upon them. The snoring of children, the burble of owls, the sound of my daughter typing her papers for school in the other room, the sound of my sons wrangling and wrestling and howling and yowling, all sounds of whatever tone or tenor issue for my children. My children and all the forms of coupled pain and joy, which is to say everything alive, which is to say all prayers, which is what I just did. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I read that piece in a grade school. I love visiting grade schools. I read that piece in a grade school. A kid raised their hand. Mr. Boyle. I'm like, so much for fame. <laughs> if I won the damn Oregon Book Award, I'd be Mr. Doyle, but no. Uh, she goes, I got a question. I said, what? She goes, you say that that's fiction, but that's really all about you, isn't it? I'm like, guilty. <laughs> uh, I love visiting schools. I visited the best question I ever got from. Uh, uh, well, hi, I tell you, here, here's some. Hang on. Please hold. I visited a kindergarten the other day. Well, let me finish the story. The best question I ever got from a child in grade school, again, a girl. It's always a girl who asks me the right question. She raised her hand. I said, yes. And she goes, yes, I have a question. Is that your real nose? <laughs> I said, pardon me? And she goes, well, why do you make that sound? You make, do you have a speech defect? <laughs> So let me tell you about my brothers. <laughs> so I visited kindergarten the other day, and these are some of the questions the children asked me. Okay? They wrote them down on pieces of paper, and then they read their papers. They were, they were five and six, these kids. And so they read their papers haltingly to me, and I thought I was going to float into the sky with happiness. I was so happy because the questions were so unusual. Why do you not write about the other birds? <laughs> the, teacher, the teacher had read some of it, basically told Mink River in 10 minutes to them, right? It was like the sped up acid version. <laughs> and so, so they basically, they, they hear the teacher, blah, 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 book about a crow. That's what they heard. <laughs> if I become like you, says John, I will write a book about a roughed grouse. <laughs> Eli, age five. How do you make your stories so long? <laughs> Best one of all, which I had him, write, had him sign and have carried my wallet. Alexander, age five. How do you write your letters so tiny to fit all those words on the page? <laughs> and silly me. See, I've, I've screwed with the heads of children all my life. And I said, so, well, I, I write really big. And then the, the lady inside the computer um, uh, there's a lady inside every computer about the size of a dime. Did you know that? And, and the kid's like, really? <laughs> Nora, do you see a lot of crows where you live? Is that why you write books about crows? Have you ever seen a love bird? Said, why have you not written a book about a red-winged blackbird? <laughs> talk about Catholic writers. You talk about Flannery O'Connor and Andre Dubas and Annie Dillard. I mean, you know, unbelievable writers. And so, you know, and a whole hour devoted to Catholic literature, American Catholic literature. And afterwards, this lady comes up to me and she goes, so are you Catholic? I said, well, what? <laughs> <laughs> I just sort of spent an hour where I thought I made it nakedly clear that, yes, I'm still a Catholic, but, uh, despite other things, you know, yes. And she goes, because you have a future in the evangelical church. <laughs> I can feel my mother 
was standing behind me ready to hit me in the head. I was like, no, 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 ma'am. Uh, my mother would be very upset. But let me read you one little piece. It, actually, it's, it, it, among them, I've gotten the most amazing response, so sweet and, and heartfelt um, for, for Mick River. You know, I've written many other books, and, 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 and nobody ever got better letters than me to, as an essayist. I got, I've gotten unbelievably heartrending, beautiful pieces as an essayist. And, and the good ones are, the ones that don't begin, dear idiot, uh, <laughs> are about, um, say, hey, your piece hit me in my heart, man. Your piece hit me where I live. Or, even better, your piece hit me when I really needed to be hit. Thank you. And, and, and so I've been overwhelmed. Nobody, not Barry Lopez or Ken Kesey or Ursula Gwynn, ever got the letters that I got, I think. You know, I think it's, you know, I'm, so I can't argue with Ken Kesey, he's not here. So. Uh, but then with the novel I discovered, people, people read novels in a different way. You, you swim in a novel, you live in it. You know, like an essay you read, you can read in the bathroom. The novel, you've got to be in bed with it for two weeks, you know. And, and I love teasing my lovely bride, saying, you know, a lot of women write to me and say, oh my God, I loved your book, The Strange Language, The Playful Music of the Language. I read it to my husband aloud at night in bed, and I'm thinking, I'm widely hated by husbands. <laughs> a, and then B, I love teasing my lovely bride saying, you know, a lot of, pe a lot of women read my book naked. She's like, <laughs> she's like, Brian, will you stop? <laughs> anyway, but one of the questions I get a lot is, if, uh, if you could write, if you could add to it now, what would you add? And, and the first time somebody asked me that, you know how stuff pops out, an answer pops out of your mouth sometimes, like Ronald Reagan, it's just without, without a filter. <laughs> There's no filter, right? It just pops out. Trees are the cause of pollution, says Reagan. <laughs> what? <laughs> you know? I said, oh, the nun and the crow. The, you know, the nun and the crow. I would write more than the nun and the crow, you know? This just happened to me, by the way. I was visiting another school. See, the whole theme of the evening is me making an ass of myself in school. And, and a kid said, I was visiting a, 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 a fourth grade, I think. And, and uh, I was going on and on about miracles and forgiveness and mercy, all the things that I'm obsessed with. Laughter is a weapon against the dark, you know, and stuff like that. And miracles and miracles. And the world is pregnant every minute and is pregnant with miracles if we can only see. And so afterwards, a kid, oh, again, a girl. <laughs> Must have been the same girl. <laughs> Raised her hand. I got a question. I said, yes. And she goes, you're going on and on about miracles. Have you ever seen any miracles? And Tech Felter defunct, out pops. I said, have I seen any miracles? Hell yes, I've seen miracles. I saw people come out of my wife. <laughs> and, and off I went. And, and, and these kids, are, they're all, and, and, and without, it just popped, poured out. I said, I, I've, I've seen, there were people living inside the woman I love. And, and they were living in there. It, it was like she was an apartment building. And, and there were people living in there, and they kept coming out. And, and, and they, like, and like a head would come out with this not supposed to be a head. And, and every liquid imaginable was there. It was awful. It was the, I was so tired. And, and, and I, look, I suddenly get a grip and look up, and, and every kid's looking like... <laughs> And the poor teacher, you know, the poor teacher, all the blood had drained out of her. And she said to me later, a line I'll never forget the rest of my life. She goes, you know, Mr. Doyle, you're the finest birth control device ever.